So welcome to the PGA uh, for our JavaScript meetup. I'm really grateful to my boss for opening up the space for us to be able to host for you here. Um, if anybody doesn't know where the restrooms are, they're just outside the door. Tim told me to mention that. Um, so men's and women's room. Uh, again, thanks for joining us. Uh, the talk today will be on APIs and Postman. Um, so before I actually jump too far deep into it, I wanted to get an idea. Does anybody here not familiar with APIs at all? Do we have any complete API beginners? No, one, okay. So I'll try not to go completely too far too deep. Um, if you are looking for the slides, the slides are at this URL, um, http bit.ly slash postman.api. I can't believe that was still available. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Jason from last week, uh, last month, uh, when he started a trend I hope is going to become a trend of learning to learn. And I hope that the future presenters will take cue from that and throw in some information, helpful information for everybody where they like to learn from. So I highly encourage everybody to continue learning. I don't think you can be a good developer without learning something new probably every day. Um, so, and it doesn't have to be development related. So, so commit to learning to your ongoing learning experiences. And some of my uh, favorite places are Stack Overflow. Um, basically, if you have a question and you search for it on Google, Stack Overflow will probably come up near the top anyways. If it doesn't and you go on there, you can find some very specific answers to some very specific questions. And if by some chance, which is probably only about a 10% chance, they don't already have an answer to the question that you have, you can post new questions on there, and if other people have similar questions, they can actually vote up your questions. So it becomes a really useful tool. And it's also great if you have an answer. So you can learn by looking what other people are asking and then answering some of the questions, which can help you learn new things, um, or you might already know an answer and just help somebody out. Um, Plural site uh, is a great uh, website. Uh, Jason mentioned uh, lynda.com before. Um, there's also egghead.io. There's several of these um, websites where they have video tutorials and they're fairly in depth with a lot of information. Um, all of them are great, including YouTube, which is free, but Plural site does have a great collection of courses and I wanted to throw it out because it has not been mentioned. Podcasts is my personal favorite. Um, actually, audiobooks is my personal favorite, but there are not very many audiobooks available on JavaScript because you kind of sort of need some visuals, usually. Um, there's often code examples, there's often graphics, but there are some great podcasts, which I kind of made a list in my presenter notes. One second. Um, yep, right there. Oh, God bless. No, that's not it. There. So uh, JavaScript Jabber is the one I've been listening to actively for a while now. Um, they cover a whole lot of stuff on JavaScript and have some great guest speakers. Note Up is a node specific uh, uh, podcast. 5.js is actually a really cool thing. They just do five minutes of JavaScript so you can learn very small things and stay up to date. Shop Talk um, for CSS and some other stuff. They cover a lot of stuff. Developer T was one of the first development podcasts I jumped into. Um, it had some useful information. I didn't fall in love with it. Development related but not JavaScript related are This Agile Life, Agile for Humans, Coder Radio, Complete Developer Podcast, The Change Log, they do a lot of great stuff on Software Engineering Radio. That's just what's on my list. Um, you can guys can definitely follow a lot more of what's available. Um, just do a search. So podcasts are definitely a great tool. Well, uh, you share the, back to the, group when you're the list? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, GitHub is maybe not be the most obvious learning tool, but it is a wonderful learning tool. Um, there's two types of learnings that I know you can do on there. One is their entire textbooks that are published that you can actually contribute to. So not only can you read them, you can actually submit changes, examples, follow examples, and they have some great tutorials that you can follow step by step by just going through the repos or by checkout process. So instead of having to download a big zip file and going like start folder and folder example number two, next first folder, last folder, you can just go through one example and follow it from beginning to completion um, by going through their uh, commit log. The second way is of course looking at some of the um, industry superstars and looking at what kind of code commits they have done. 
um, and just look at what some of the most known names have publicly posted in open source communities. So you can just look through them, and if you're brave enough, you can actually ask to contribute. Some of those communities will let pretty much anybody try to contribute. So if you're any good, you can actually hand that with code in some major open source um, platforms. There are forums available for just about any technology and language specific. So I've in the past have you made use of SQL Server forums a lot. There's some true experts that do look at the information that um, questions and they post some really great answers. So whatever language you're using, of course JavaScript and any other one, there are forums that you should probably participate in. And my most frequent note to everybody is give yourself ability to fail. Um, success comes from freedom to fail. I think Mark Zuckerberg has been quoted uh, on that and many other tech leaders. Um, but that doesn't mean fail and stop. It means fail fast, fail often, but some of the more modern ways are failed forward and failed better. I'm not going to explain the differences between each approach. You can definitely look them up. But at the bottom of that is kind of the world famous light bulb. So a thousand tries and then it finally worked. So I tend to think of it as a failure every time I hit control S and it doesn't do what I want, which is pretty much almost every time I hit control S until it actually does what I want. Um, <laughs> so don't threat on failing because the more often you save and the more often you commit your code and go over the versioning, you will get to something great. So let yourself do that. Just learn from every little failure, no matter how little it is. So just always learn, always move forward, and don't fret it. So today we're going to talk about APIs. Um, the most, what does it stand for? Is Application Programming Interface. Um, my personal note is they're not scary. They might look like they're scary and there's a lot to learn about them potentially, but in the grand scheme of web development, they're not the scariest thing out there. Um, a good example I have seen is to think of what is an API is consider an ATM. So, so you walk up to an ATM and you will try to get some money out of it. Now, full story told, there's probably multiple APIs involved in that, everything from hardware processors on that ATM to whatnot. But if we simplify it, that ATM, one way or another, will have to communicate with a bank that it belongs to, or another bank, and find out, do you have enough funds to withdraw from which account and communicate back to you? Technical difficulties. You're supposed to say a joke when that happened, or something along those lines. All right, we're back. All right, so APIs, think of them as an ATM. The ATM, somebody comes to use it, they work with a user interface. It has a program running in the background that allows that ATM to communicate with some sort of a data server at the bank, and that bank returns the information it needs. And there's some sort of a handshake that happens, and the, it, they agree on a data format in which it's gonna exchange that information, hopefully in a secure way. So what types of APIs are there? There's a variety. Um, I'm not even going to mention all of them, but some of them are hardware. So every computer processor has an API. That's how most basic programming languages work. Um, every operating system has an API. Um, that's how higher level programming languages work with operating systems. And our most friendly and relevant today is the web services API that are used by pretty much every br big brand name that you guys are familiar with, such as Twitter, Instagram, Google, Facebook, and pretty much anything else. I've used Flickr before to make some interesting tools. Um, so if you're looking to consume any kind of data, it's probably available to you. Um, you can write your own custom tools versus like Google's products, Facebook products, you can make your own friend feed or news feed if you want. You can make your own Twitter clients, all that kind of stuff. Um, what do web APIs actually do? Uh, they allow applications or web services to communicate with one another to connect to a data, uh, to connect a server and data, and to exchange that data or get data from a server. Just like hitting a banana it talks to a computer. So APIs for web services work, or there's different API protocols. Um, some of the more common ones are REST, SOAP, GraphQL is probably the most recent one that I'm aware of, it's by Facebook. Um, there are others. There's a link in here that you're welcome to read about. Um, I don't want to dive too deep into each protocol. If you guys have questions, I can do my best to answer. I know that um, most of the work that 
we've been doing lately is using a REST protocol. And there's some specifics with REST, but they all have something in common. So on a bit, and you can use Postman definitely with REST and SOAP and probably with GraphQL, though I have not tried to use um, Postman with GraphQL. At the foundation of an API, you need a way to connect to what's called an endpoint. Those are usually um, identified by a uniform user, uh, resource identifier, also known as a URI. And you guys are most familiar with URLs for the web addresses that we go to every day. Um, URLs is a subset of URI. So URI is a slightly higher level. It's not protocol specific. Um, there's different ways to access APIs. Uh, they're called verbs. Um, the most common one is a GET request when you ask the server to give you something back. Um, you can also post to the server. Usually that means submitting a form or something similar. Um, doing a put usually does an update to an existing data and there's others that I have not yet had the reason to use. Question. Yes? What the hell's the difference between patch and put? I always mess it up and mess it up like that. Why are they bad He's trying to, he's testing. He knows he has. It's a good test and I have a link <laughs> that <Wow>. answers. <laughs> So I've used put, I've used post, I've used get, I have not used patch. Okay. There's probably a reason for that. Um, I'll go with Tim's update on that. So we're going to go with the answer being put as a multi-record update and patch as a single field update. Record set. Okay, um, for those of you on video. All right, so you can exchange data in various formats. Um, I guess two of the most common ones are XML, which is extensible markup language, and JSON, which is the JavaScript object notation. XML, I think, is only two years older than JSON. Um, it just so happened that it was the first data language that I learned, and I really liked it. Um, Probably should have started with JSON because it seems to have quickly surpassed what XML is capable of. Um, there are some arguments which are more readable because I learned it first. I think XML is actually more readable than JSON, but anybody who learned JSON first will probably tell you otherwise. Um, I think I had notes on that as well. Oh. Yeah, so I, I had some more like diff dictionary types of definitions of what each are. And from the JSON API website, they were saying it's a fat-free alternative to XML. So those of you who are health conscious probably want to use JSON. Um, um, the next thing I actually wanted to show you is a, whoops, that was weird. It went back. Um, was a ver very basic example of what an API call looks like not in Postman. So I spent my several years in the past working with APIs and I did not need Postman because those APIs were publicly available. So I'm sure several of you are familiar with clicking a link and going to a browser and being able to see a data response from a server. So this, this just happens to be in the JSON format. Um, this particular data set comes from this wonderful website that gives you information on countries. And it's publicly available. Now, what is the biggest problem with this making this available to us? Anybody? It's not secured. It's not secured. Um, so if we were malicious and for whatever reason decided to completely tank their server, or there was, for example, let's say Olympics happening, and we built an app that relied on their API for working with countries, and that app became really popular, just the, not maliciously, but by being a good citizen, you could still potentially tank their servers because they're completely wide open. So we here uh, at the PGA ran into a similar issue with our scoring system where our first generation of data feeds was publicly available. It was shared with our partners, and we kind of relied on the fact that most people didn't know the URLs to those endpoints, so we weren't too concerned. Until it just so happens that in good conscience, some of our partners forgot to turn off some of their old apps, and they just continued to consume our old APIs and adding more and more 
weight to our servers. They're taxing our servers more. So, um, towards, I think we started last year, but basically, let's say this year, we transitioned into a secured approach. So, there's several ways for securing your APIs. The, some of the more popular ones are called API gateways. Um, Amazon provides a wonderful tool, well, maybe wonderful is an overstatement, but a, a useful tool. Um, it's very cheap. It's something like pennies per million or dollar, a couple of dollars for like a million transactions or something along those lines. It's almost free. It's not quite free, so if you have a popular app, you'll actually pay them something. But basically, it's almost free. It's simple but not easy. So it does, it does have a learning curve, but with tinkering enough, probably within a couple of hours, you can, should be able to figure it out. Apigee is a great um, company who also does uh, API gateways. They've been acquired by Google, so that should mean something. Um, I have been to some of their presentations in the past, and they were very um, informative. OAuth is a way to potentially secure them as well. And the custom way is, in this case, we went, we ended up going custom because we have a very, a finite number of customers who are, had already implemented our data feeds and we wanted to provide them with a minimal number, amount of changes that we could kind of ha hold their hand on. So it was a very specific use case. If I was gonna give somebody advice, I would say go with an API gateway if you're getting started. And, um, it's probably where we're going to end up in the near future as well. But what would you need to do a custom security for your uh, API? At the very minimum, you should issue your clients or your partners a public key. You should hand deliver them on a napkin a private key. Well, that's what the federal government says. There are actually there's a website I found called uh, onetimesecret.com, which works wonderfully. You can set how long a certain piece of text will exist. You can protect it with an extra password. And you can actually send that to the partner and they can open it. And then once it's been opened, it will no longer be available to anybody. So um, if somebody opens it before they get it, you know there's been a breach and you can reset that key. Um, so there are digital ways of doing it, but according to our federal government, they do say for private keys, they should be delivered in person and shredded afterwards. Um, the third piece you need is a timestamp. Now, a timestamp isn't essential, but it's highly recommended, and it's used to create timeliness of the request. So once the key is created, it should only be valid for a certain period of time. We chose 60 minutes, um, uh, 60 seconds uh, before or after the atomic time, because not every server is in sync. Um, it might be better to make it maybe two minutes before and after, just to make sure that nobody's clock is that much off. Um, some people, if it's non-essential data, can make it hours or days that access is allowed before it's revoked for a token. And then you calculate the hash. Um, in the not so distant, distant past, people used a SHA-1 algorithm. It's since been, well, hacked is probably not the right word, but people have be found a way to create a duplicate key from a different source. So. We've used SHA-256 algorithm for encryption. That's been the standard for right now. Give them another few more years and advances in power, we'll probably have to change it again. Oh, um, side note, completely unrelated to APIs, uh, and this is just my general advice to everybody on how to create your personal passwords if you're not using a password manager and still remember all of them and never use the same one for any website. Um, what I do is I have a, my favorite password in mind, I have a special character in there. And then you look at the website that you're logging into, come up with a simple mental hash you can consistently do and append that or prepend that to your password, which would make it unique to every website you use, and yet you will never forget it because your actual password is always the same, but it has some randomness to it that only you can go through this simple mental exercise. Now, an example of one would be like, I don't know, take the first and last character and the number of characters in the company name, something like that. Come up with something that will work for you consistently that you won't forget, and you will be able to have a secure password for every website, and they'll never be the same, and you'll never forget it. So that's just a personal tidbit. So once we implemented the secured, a custom security for our website, or for our APIs, I quickly realized that in order for me to test it in the browser, 
I have to go into SQL Server, run a query, grab the key, append it to my URL string, try to test it, and then within 60 seconds, the darn thing expires and I have to do it all over again. So it became a very difficult task. And I quickly realized this was not the right tool to do testing. Um, hopefully that quickly, literally was very quickly, within a few minutes. And some of my friends and coworkers were raving about Postman. So lo and behold, I had to learn one and I was really excited. We did a little short show and tell at JavaScript meetup once where they told me I should really make a presentation about it and here I am. So let's learn a little bit about Postman. Oh, that's not the one, the other one. Where'd it go? You said a JSON response in there. Uh, no, it's just a get. Oh, it's right here. No, he, he's right. I, I do believe, I do believe I am using, oh, God bless me, if I, there's a, there's a JSON uh, syntax highlighting a plugin. I think it's called something like Beautify JSON or something along those lines. I was trying to remember the name of it. Oh, come on. Okay, we'll go with that. There's a handful of them. If you look in the Chrome plugin store, there's like a bunch and they all make it look slightly different, different colors and whatnot. So uh, absolutely, good, good point, thank you for that. Um, there, there are a ton of tools actually available and um, before even dive into Postman. So Postman started out as a Chrome extension and it still exists as a Chrome extension. Now, I actually love that they implemented a desktop version because I can run it separately out of my browser. They've added actually, since then, added some additional functionality that you can use it with a command line. You can do, I'm jumping ahead, schedule tasks with it. You can use it as a server to test against, to have it provide mock data for your applications. Um, but they did start in a browser in a Chrome, um, in a, as a plugin. And there's actually a whole lot of cool stuff you can do with plugins. Um, if you're not using them, um, there's a lot. And I, I think, I thought I had another note on, in my podcast, all the way in the beginning. There's a, for Firefox, there's a plugin that will let you go on a page and scrape it for every link to an MP3. So if you're not an Apple user, or even if you are an Apple user, but you want to plug a USB drive into your car with like every MP3 of a podcast that existed for the last five years, there's a plugin for that, and I do have it, so I might as well tell you what it was. Oh, wrong tool. Hang on, let me go real quick to my, where did it go? Use, I must have closed it. Presenter notes on. Oh, it's called Down Them All, Firefox plugin. Um, and I've been able to just click it once, and it would literally grab like the last four or five years of JavaScript Jabber and throw it in the thumb drive, plug it into my car. And every time you get into my car now, there's an episode of JavaScript Jabber playing for like until I run out. I'm about two thirds through. <laughs> Let's see, okay, so we're here. The main difficulty came from and that was solved by my fa favorite Postman feature um, called pre-request script, was the fact that it required a timely signature. Um, now my first instinct was maybe I should make that time frame short, longer on development instead of it being like 60 seconds, maybe you make it 60 minutes, but even that would be annoying because every 60 minutes you still have to mess with your hashes and figure them out and put them in a browser and it's just a mess. Um, it also didn't, doesn't give you any easy ways of working with a lot of different endpoints and definitely no scheduling tests and anything like that. So it just became a limitation. But the first, my first hurdle I ran into was the fact, oh my God, I need to change this hash token frequently and I don't have a quick, easy way of generating it and putting it in a browser for every request I need because you, in addition to the hash token, you also need to provide the time string. So it's a lot of copy and pasting, which Postman quickly and easily solved for me. So Postman overview, it handles a lot of different things for you. Something I already mentioned, um, you can do regular requests, regular get requests, you can do post requests, you can do any other verb request. It handles responses in just about any format. Um, it can handle collections of endpoints. So you can 
create endpoints per project, per topic, um, per client. It gives you a great way of managing collections of endpoint URIs and folders within those. It gives you a way to create test suites um, where you can test what's coming back from every endpoint to make sure that they're working correctly. Um, you can string several requests together where they pass data from one request to another. So to create uh, what they call collection runs. And then um, you can also make it as a server locally that takes snapshots of your data and feeds it back to your apps for testing. Now I haven't quite explored everything that it does. Um, so some of it I've only read about and I can share with you guys the details. Their documentation is wonderful. Um, they do have environments, so you can also set it up with one click to change between your development environment, staging potentially, production possibly. Um, and fortunately for this group, um, they work with JavaScript. So if you are going to write your tests or your pre-request scripts, which is my favorite feature I'll go over shortly, it is in JavaScript, which should mean it's easy for you, which might not actually mean it's easy, but for JavaScript developers, it should be a pretty sh small learning curve. And they do have some of the most popular libraries baked right in. So Crypto.js is a part, of, um, a part of Postman. You can use it right in there. Lodash is also right in there, and there are several others. So. Oh, so the very first tool that I didn't know existed in Postman when I first started that may not have been there, or I didn't see it in there, or either wasn't in there or just didn't see it. It was one of the two. Um, they do have developer tools baked in, which is very similar to, if not identical to, the Chrome developer tools. So you can do your console.log and similar stuff to see what's actually happening. But I didn't think it was in there, so I had to find a workaround. So I'm going to show you one more um, great way to learn and share code with friends for small examples. It's called JS Fiddle. It does have several other, I want to call them clones, which basically do the same thing. CodePen is a wonderful tool. It has great CSS examples. And I think Jason was at REPL? I like REPL. Jason likes REPL. They basically kind of sort of all do the same thing. So before I wrote this little piece of code, and it's literally like seven lines of code, um, in JavaScript correctly. I needed a way to test the fact that my logic was producing the correct output um, that would match what my, my backend wanted. So this fortunately has some test private keys literally as a string. Um, so no keys are being exposed here. And I used JS Fiddle. The hardest part about this whole thing, um, going back to Stack Overflow, was finding a host that had the correct version of the Crypto.js library available. The second hardest thing was... Right, but most common, most common library, yes, I'm not sure if they have Crypto.js, they, they might. Um, I had to, I probably spent more time than I should have looking for a CDN that had the correct version available. Most examples on Stack Overflow were pointing to Google, and Google scrapped or moved where they were from. So literally everything about Crypto.js on Stack Overflow as of like eight months ago, 10 months ago is outdated. So probably should have posted a new link on there. Um, in any case, I wrote very, very short script and this is probably not even the best way to write it, but all I wanted to produce was the correct steps and sequence that would give me the result that I wanted. And then I was able to just take this code, literally copy and paste it into my new best friend. Now before I actually show you how that piece of code works, I'm gonna go back to my very first example, this guy. And just to demonstrate, the, the very, very basic use case for Postman is to take a URL that points to an API, put it in their get field, hit the send button, and down here get, comes your response. At this point, you gained no improvement over doing it in the browser, but it is formatted pretty. It does give you a couple of different ways of viewing it. You can raw data, you can see text data. Um, it's helpful in some ways. You know, you can, it has some measurements, how big the data is, how long it took, but it doesn't really give you all that much this, at this point. So the very next thing um, I was asked to do was to create a prototype for consuming an API through the Amazon API gateway. And I tried, and it did not take very long, 
But the biggest hurdle was actually finding one piece of documentation that was very hard, and I'm gonna share it with you first. So if you're gonna use um, a signature, API signature, I'm sorry, AWS signature for your requests that come through the API, Amazon API gateway, there's one thing that's only mentioned like one point on the internet that's very hard to find. And even in that point, they have the capitalization wrong. So what you do need is this extra key called the x-api-key. Now this is only required if on the, in your API, maybe I should show a small glimpse of this. So this is kind of sort of what an Amazon API gateway tool looks like. This is not all of it, but within it, you can, there's actually a way to test. And within that, when you do your method request, there's this little piece called API key required. Is it too small? That might be too small. So we had this on. I didn't even know if it should be on or off. It sounded like it was a good security measure. So I had it on and nothing would work. So everything else seemed to work except that part. And I kept on getting, um, I'll show you what happens if you don't have that key. So if you turn, you can turn any cookie off. You can turn any of your headers off and see what the result would be. So it kept giving me a message forbidden, or the message was that I was forbidden. I'm like, no, I'm not. I know my, my keys are correct. I copied and pasted them. I generated new keys. I followed every step and every guide, and it just would not work. And until I finally found the way to fix it was by adding this extra header. And then, lo and behold, poof, it works. There's one more thing I wanted to mention on the Amazon API side. So in, they have this thing called stages in which they have a URL that you can click supposedly to test your endpoint. Somehow, oddly enough, I don't know if they didn't quite think this part through or what, or maybe it's supposed to do it this way. When I click that, I get the same, well, similar message saying, missing authentication token. And I was like, well, that's kind of the whole point. Like, shouldn't I be able to click on this thing to test it to make sure it's working? And now it wants me to authenticate it. So I was like, what do I do? So inside their resources tab, let me back up one step. They do have this test lightning guy. So if you guys are in here and you're looking for it, if you hit that test, it will actually work when you hit this test button down here. So they do have a way for you to test a secure API through their gateway. For whatever reason, the most obvious place where it has invoke URL and you click it, it doesn't work. It should work. There should at least be buttons like, okay, make this work or something. Um, or lick me to the test. Okay, back to, back to Postman. Uh, let me take a quick step back. So in, in here, this is the same URL I got from the API gateway. That's the same URL. Copied and pasted into here. Went under authentication. It defaults to no auth. If I try it that way, it'll Actually, at this point, it'll still work. Anybody want to know why it still works, even if I said no auth? Next thing, you're not allowed to answer. You already know the right answer. N partially, it's actually because all the other headers are already present. So once you make the request, um, the tool are, is basically caching your headers for you. So the first time you make that request with, um, without the authentication, you will get this missing authentication token. Once you add authentication in, I could, to demonstrate, I'll actually delete this keys. I'll leave the XAPI one in there. So missing authentication token, switch to authentication, enable AWS signature. Now this will bring me up to one other one of my favorite features is uh, a way to have your keys without kind of having to expose them in a demo, at least, or in your collections. So, so some of the power of Postman is it lets you share collections and environments with your coworkers, partners, etc. But let's say you want to share all your code, but you don't want to give away your personal keys or your company's keys. You can actually share the collection that would have the variable names, so to speak, um, assigned, but the actual keys that will have to plug in on their own in their environment. So they can take your code, plug in their keys, and it will still work as long as they have authentication access. So the keys, keys uh, exist in a couple of different places. So up here in upper right corner, can you see, is it too small? Hopefully you can see. I'll just point. Up here, 
uh, is where you define the environment that you're working with. In this case, I'm actually working with PGA production, but if I hit that drop down, I have PGA dev and no, and you can set up as many environments as you want. And then there's, if you click on this little gear icon and go under manage environments, so those are the two that I've been working with. And under globals are the global variables that you want available to all of your environments. For example, in my case, the key for the scoring system test is universal across environments, so it's in the global. It doesn't have to be in that case. But anything that needs to be shared across environments can be in the global, and it works exactly the same way. The way you define them is you click on there, and you can just give it a name and type whatever you want. You can also use it program programmatically, which I'll show you shortly. Okay, so um, any questions on the uh, Amazon example? Because I'm gonna move away from it. No? Okay. The next example I will talk to is some of the custom stuff that we have built. And the biggest difference, a simple example would be something like, Where is it? Event. Get event details. So in our environment, I was able to put a different URL prefix for development environment versus stage. So I don't, the only thing I have to do to hit the two different environments is to change that, and it will change this URL. The second thing is you'll notice I use variables in the actual uh, that are pre-calculated. So this is my favorite feature. So I have this pre-request script, which is straight up JavaScript, and as I mentioned before, it's a copy-paste of what I had in JS Fiddle. In here, I'm able to access, here's my global variable. Is that too small? Is it better? That's about as big as it's gonna get, I think. Really? Ah, I don't know. I think that's as, good, that's as big as it gets. Um, anyways, so you say postman that get global variable name the variable, and it'll give you back what you stole in your globals. You can set and get your environmental variables in a very similar way. So I calculate, uh, either set them as a var, or I have to do a little bit of math like to get the date and whatnot. Whatever you do with your logic, you can get it out of the variable, or you can set it into a variable with a particular name. So the three variables you saw in my environmental variables that were K, D, T, and H, probably not the best variable names, um, but they came from here. I did not have to type them in. Not only did I not type them in, they also change every time I run the process. So whenever I submit the request, it goes through and says, what time is it now? What should be my hash for that time frame, and then it takes the results of it and plugs it into my, whoops, get request. So that, that gets appended to my URL. How do you use variables? Very simple, you put double brackets on it, so people who are familiar with like Angular or similar, just put two of them, and it works. Uh, you, where, where did URL come from in your example? So, Ah, so the URL does come from the environmental variable that I set in the environmental variables. So that comes from here. So in this case, it's devdata.pgscore.net. And if I change it um, to prod, it'll give me the prod URL. The part in between is the actual endpoint. So that changes per endpoint, asking for whatever it needs. Um, if I hit send, hopefully everything will work. Oh. What? Really? Oh, God bless. Oh, huh. thanks. Live coding, love it. <laughs> Good catch. So it, in this case, it's a very simple endpoint that just gives me the event name and a couple of pieces of information about the event, like its ID, how many leaders we want to display, similar things. Um, to go back to my argument that I think XML is prettier, um, here's
here's an example that does a very similar thing um, for an XML data endpoint. I think that is very easy to read. It has nodes. Each element has a node within it. It's so easy to follow. Pick your poison. This is not fat free, supposedly. Well, so on the API side, um, I have a very similar implementation that calculates the hash. It actually happens in our case inside SQL Server, and it's insanely fast. I don't know how they do it. Um, but what you need to provide to it, kind of what I mentioned before, is the public key is this K variable, and it's known to both parties. In this case, it's PGA of America with a data pendant that's <coughs> long enough and cryptic enough, I think, for it to be a good public key. Um, it has a date when this request was executed. Um, mind you that I did have to add uh, URL coding around the date, but it ha that's done after the data is already used to calculate the hash, which could be a potential um, problem for some people. And then the actual hash that's calculated by my, in this case, pre-request script. And it's really as simple as taking those things and throwing it inside the CryptoJS SHA-256 function, again, it's too small, but right here. It does require that empty blank string at the end. I don't know why, but if you don't put it in there, it won't work. So just follow the examples on Stack Overflow or any other resource. I don't actually know exactly why they want that blank string in there, but it's necessary in this example. Um, so the server takes the public key. It takes the date. It converts the date back into the regular date format that it needs. It knows the private key for person who was making the request based on their public key. So the private key is never exposed, even outside of the database. And then it uses the same algorithm, SHA-256, to take those three elements together, create the SHA, and only if the SHA signature that um, the hash signature, I'm sorry, not sure. The hash signature that was sent through the request matches exactly the hash signature that the server calculated, which I was when I was playing around with it, I was doing it with some test variables um, shown here. So this is kind of what the signature looks like. It's kind of gibberish, but there are several requirements. Uh, again, so the encode URI component is important, which means you have to decode it on the other end. Same thing goes for the date. Um, so there's a few little hurdles that you could overcome if you are doing your own custom. But if you can avoid doing your own, I still recommend pick your poison, go with APG, a, uh, Amazon API Gateway, pay them a few cents and be done with it and let them do most of the hurdle for you. And then there's libraries out there that can help people authenticate. But the downside is you will basically enforce your users to use whichever gateway you're using for authentication. So if it's Amazon, they will have to have the IAM credentials available. So if somebody's not familiar with that or doesn't know how to use it, there's an extra learning curve there for those people. Um, but there's so many guides available now that I don't think it's an issue anymore. Okay. So um, this pre-request script, and you used it here to handle your passion out of it. You could do that for all kinds of other variables too. You might be use, use a, a pre-request script to um, generate random data that you wanted to send through as to test posts. Absolutely. So not only that, um, you, you can use it for anything. It's JavaScript. So anything you can pretty much do in JavaScript, you can do a pre-request script, um, including all the libraries that come packaged uh, in Postman. Further, you can actually use the results in your in in um, in the test thing, the one right after, you can take the results of that script, change your environmental variables or create new environmental variables, and then pass them into an other script in your collection. Based on the response that's coming back? 
Yes. So you can string together, like let's say, give me the current event ID. Okay, here's my current event. Now give me that event detail. Okay, now what round is that event in? Third. Okay, now give me the scores for the third round. Okay, now give me the players for the third round. Now give me the leader for the third round. So you can string them all together into one test suite collection. Um, I have not actually done it, but I do know where to go at least to get it, I think. Um, I think. It's this three dots, I think. Or not. I really, I really thought, oh, so if I hit this run guy, oh, so there's a collection runner. So, okay, if you know, if that was too fast. So you click this little guy, there's actually two things, which, speaking of user experience, I overall, I love their UI, but there's a few things that kind of drive me nuts, like the circle, I don't have no idea what it means and why it's there. Up here, it means it's not saved. But, but down here, it does not mean it's not saved, I don't think, because like that's the file that saves stuff, so why would it go down there also? It makes no sense to me. Um, also, they have like, kind of two buttons that almost do the same thing. You hit this like three dots we, we're familiar with for user experience, um, a menu. You see three dots, you know it's a menu. We've been doing it for years. But they also have this other thing that also gives you a menu. They, they tried. Um, they try, they're still improving it, it's wonderful. They have a great support forum, and uh, you guys are most welcome to comment on there, and they do take a lot of things to heart. Probably I should have mentioned my first feature, well, I'll, I'll mention my absolute must-have feature last. So for the collection run, this is also where you can go to share it with your teammates. Um, they do have different pricing structures, so I think if you want to share within your organization, you got to pay them a little, and if you want to share like outside of your organization, you got to pay them a little more, something along those lines. No one expert on their pricing. They have a pro model and an enterprise model. Yes? Uh, by the way, are we seeing Postman or Postman Pro? This is Postman, I think. I don't think on my laptop I have Pro. Okay. Um, so this is, this is all free. Awesome. Um, it does let you sync three computers at the same time as long as you're the same user. So I could be working on here, save something, and it's already available on my desktop downstairs. That's free. So you get three concurrent connections. Um, anyway, so if you want to run a collection, you hit this run button, it opens up the collection runner, um, and it kind of gives you a whole bunch of settings that you can do, iterations, delay, all the requests, and um, I am, this is about as far as my expertise goes. They do have a way now called new man, I guess it's a joke on Postman that lets you run stuff in command line. This is, must be where this guy uh, links to. They do have amazing documentation for all of this stuff. So the, you can kind of walk step by step. They have some videos that explain things. And of course, countless people on YouTube and other channels who've gotten through some excellent demos and specifics. But for any developer, almost any developer, who likes their development environment to be dark, the first setting you will want to change is under, on a PC file settings, on a Mac under whatever, Mac app preferences, the other way. Um, go, go in the theme and change it to the dark, because if it wasn't dark, it would be blinding, in my opinion. But this is a must have. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yes. Concerned of putting your private keys into something that's known to make random API calls that they're not um, creating those private keys somewhere in their big server farm and wherever they That is a very, very good question that I don't think I'm this moment I'm qualified to answer correctly. Um, but I would say that you probably want to issue API keys with care where you actually know where you're using them. So your Postman instance should probably have a dedicated API key for that instance. And if you start seeing uh, requests come in that you kind of can tell aren't yours, um, you can reset that key and be aware that there is some sort of a fraudulent thing going on pretty much right away. Um, I would just say that the best is, you know, use them with care and change them with some frequency. Um, personally, I'm not concerned. Uh, especially in this case, because our data used to be public. So this is just a really great way of limiting some of the risks, but we weren't even that exposed when it was public. Um, if you do have sensitive data, I would take a lot more time and care with your keys and figuring out the best way to protect them. 
um, to update them, to share them. Um, the secret keys are challenging, and it's probably part of the things that like an API gateway can help you with, because Amazon will keep track of the stats, so you can see who's accessing, how often they're hitting it. So like you know, if you're if you're in Postman, you're probably not hitting this several times a second. So that you could see, hey, if there's several requests coming in very quickly, it's probably not a human developer doing it, right? Um, so you can put some safeguards around it, and there's definitely some best practices about just in general managing your keys and how you're storing them. Um, there's even more, like the security talk by itself could be a course in a university or several, um, so I'm not gonna try to cover them all. Um, Tim has actually most recently had a little bit more experience than me with how to properly secure your keys. I will say that I've seen way too many times that people's passwords are stored as text in databases. Please don't do that. At the very, very least, store the SHA of that password and decode it in your code before you compare. That's not perfect, but at least better than storing plain text. Um, so if something like, well, what was the last credit union that got um, credit? Equifax. I hung in 43 million records given out to the world, basically. If they were all at least hashed, they would be almost useless to the people who got them. Now, if they were brilliant and they figured out the way to the secret key, they could totally get them all still. But it gives you a pretty serious level of protection if they are hashed. So any sensitive data, at least do that. At most, research how to best protect it beyond that, because there's definitely best practices around those. So did I have a slide? Back to slides. Did I have anything else? Oh, I guess not. So um, that was pretty much all I put together. Uh, maybe I should put this back on the link to the slides on the first one. Yes. 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 Ooh, um, I know half the answer to that question. So in the first half, as far as writing tests, it has this awesome test tab, and they give you some examples. So um, I have not actually messed too much with it, but you can do things like you can look at what the environment, or you can, well, I already done environment, send environment, whatever. but this is a very basic example, like you can send a request and do, run a function afterwards, or check how long the response time was. And you can definitely get to the actual data. You can check the, the body of the, um, like the body matches a particular string. It can get much more complex than that, so I would you have to read the documentation, all the tests that are available. Um, visually looking at this stuff, it looks similar to what I've seen in Jest, for what I've done in Jest. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one syntax, I'm sure. There's probably a library they're using behind the scenes, and if we figure out what that one is, you probably could just migrate it over to Node. Um, at the same time, if you're doing it in Node, you probably don't need to do exactly the same thing in Postman. It's kind of one and the same. They can, the automated part can be done in either. Um, this is more of the front end helpful. And if you don't have the Node, it can help some people to set up this mock data. So one thing I did not show, uh, so not there. The, up here, up, up here, there's this thing for examples. Now, this is, Another one is user experiences. This is not examples for you as a user. This is examples for your user. As in, you can save results that come back from a particular endpoint along with all the codes that go in. So response codes, like all the headers information, all of that stuff as well. And not only can you save it, you can also modify it. So you could mock an error call and whatnot and what the data would be as well. And then you can have your front end hit Postman as a web server and get all those mock responses. 
but it's not the only way. So you can absolutely do the same thing with Node, and there's some great uh, NPM packages for do the uh, same thing. Yes, Kevin. Yeah, so Newman is the command line interface, basically, for Postman built by the same people. Um, I have not actually tried it yet, but I've read quite a bit about it. It seems useful. Anybody else? Questions? Yes? That is another really good test uh, question. Um, as far as versioning the tests, I would say, as far as I know, it's definitely easier in the Node world. Um, versioning them in Postman, the only way I can think of is you can clone repos. Um, so you can say, you know, just, just say, or not repos, you can clone collections. So you can go to the collection, clone it, give it a version number. You can also export collections. Absolutely. So you can definitely export with a version number, but it's not nearly the same. I guess you can throw those and get, um, but it's kind of like a hacky way of doing it. There might be a better answer to that question that I am not aware of yet. Anybody else?